Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us today here at the um, third IOG webinar um, that, uh, for the International Ocean Governance Forum. My name is Sheila Hemans. I'm the Executive Director for the European Marine Board, and I'm being assisted today by Britt Alexander, uh, one of our science officers, and by multiple people from Action. So thank you very much if I forget to say thank you later today. Um, so today's seminar webinar will be on strengthening international ocean research data and knowledge. And um, for those of you who have um, been to the first two of these, um, you might hear some of this, uh, the, the beginning part of this is quite similar, but we wanted to keep continuation between the three different webinars. Um, so moving forward, the focus of this webinar is obviously specifically on thematic working group three, which is basically on strengthening international ocean research data and knowledge. Um, and it is part of this three part webinar series that we have for the International Ocean Governance Forum. Um, and we will be working on future steps for the forum and working groups. Um, specifically today, we wanna to look at the challenges, solutions and questions, and that's how we've structured our, our presentations. And, and we will ask you to, to look at those and to give us comments on those. Um, then also uh, just a quick rundown of the, of the agenda. We'll, we're into the welcoming housekeeping. We will have two videos from the commissioner and from um, the UN Special Envoy. Then uh, Veronica Weiss from the um, DG Mari will give us a overview of the IOG forum. And then I'll just give you a rundown of what's in the paper that you've actually um, been sent. Then we will have five speakers who will introduce the five topics of the, of the paper. And we will go into that in a little bit more detail. Be aware that the presentations that are given are basically the work of uh, the Marine Board and the, and the uh, people from the, from the consortium who is running this, this project. And it does not, with some input from the speakers, obviously, um, and it does not actually um, necessarily construe anything that the Commission, the European Commission or the Euro European External Action Service uh, would, would uh, it's not their work, it's our work. Um, then we will also have a final session where we will have a summary and discussion session and we will have concluding remarks from Ziggy Gruber, who is actually the chair of this working group for this, uh, for the International Ocean Governance and from Stephanie Smith, who is um, the leader of this project with DG Mare. So that's basically the, in, the introduction. If we then go to an overview of um, just an, an introduction of, of what is in the paper, which hopefully some of you have read, um, we're basically talking here about international ocean research data and knowledge. And here we will uh, have a opening remark from um, from the commissioner, obviously, uh, from Commissioner Virginia Sinkovicius, uh, from the Commission for Environment, Ocean and Fisheries. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining our webinars on international ocean governance. I would have liked to welcome you in Brussels, but we must to adapt to the situation, of course. Right now, the public health crisis is the most urgent challenge to address. But by holding this digital conference, we want to recall that our oceans cannot just wait until we get out of the crisis, and that we have a duty to keep the momentum of this super year for the oceans 2020. What's more, by turning this major event on ocean governance into a virtual meeting, maybe we pave the way for a new climate-friendly approach to international policymaking. Let's prove that it can be done by actively contributing to the discussions. Today's webinars are part of the EU's International Ocean Governance Forum. This forum unites stakeholders and experts within and beyond the EU, guiding the EU to ensure the conservation and the sustainable use of our oceans and seas worldwide. The ambitions are clear. More than 150 countries have adopted the 2030 Agenda, including SDG 14 on life below water. But with only 10 years to go, we need to scale up our efforts to achieve what we agreed to. 
First of all, we need to strengthen the international policy framework. This is a basic prerequisite. Some of the ongoing policy processes, such as the BBNJ negotiations or those on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, offer a unique window of opportunity. We have to grab it with both hands. Second, we need to accelerate progress on the ground, putting in practice what we preach. The challenge of climate change only exacerbates the existing pressures coming from marine pollution, unsustainable resource use or illicit activities. At the same time, the blue economy offers opportunities for sustainable economic development. So I am convinced that we can restore our marine environment while also bringing benefits to our coastal communities and the economy at large. Third, we need to strengthen our knowledge about the oceans. The start of the UN Ocean Science Decade offers the opportunity to advance the role of science and knowledge in international ocean governance. And finally, we will also now have to look at the implications of the current crisis for ocean governance and the ocean's role in the post-COVID blue-green recovery. The objective of the forum, starting with your discussions today, is to turn these challenges and opportunities into recommendations to the High Representative and the European Commission. I'm looking forward to the results of your exchanges and I invite you all to discuss them together at the meeting of the forum on 9th to 11th of December in Brussels, if all goes well. I wish you a constructive, fruitful, virtual debate. Thank you very much. Um, so that was the introduction by uh, the Commissioner. Next, we will go to the video of uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, who is the UN Special Envoy, Envoy for the Oceans, and he is a diplomat from Fiji. Obviously, everybody knows him. I'm sure everybody knows him. He's responsible for driving the implementation of uh, Sustainable Develop Development Goal 14 to conserve the sustainable use, um, sustainable use of, and resources of the ocean. Warm greetings, colleagues, friends, fellow ocean activists gathered in cyberspace for the International Ocean Governance Forum. Through all the trauma and sadness of these dark pandemic times, we must have faith that our trials will soon be over. And when they are, that we will find ourselves stepping out on the roads of recovery. Already we can see the crossroads ahead. So it's time that we fortify our resolve to take the high road that leads to a sustainable world. Humanity must not stumble back onto the temptingly low one, returning us to profligate burning of fossil fuels, planet polluting single use plastics and wanton denigration of nature. The self-interest of our species demands that unprecedented reductions in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions around the world must be central to our building back better. Only then will we reverse the decline of the ocean's health and best secure our own. The high road to a sustainable world is the blue-green recovery road, the one that brings human and natural systems back into a harmony that is based on respect and balance. This must surely be the hallmark of the UN's BBNJ Ocean Treaty Conference and the CBD's post-2020 framework, moving, for instance, to a world in which at least 30% of the ocean is protected under effective and well-managed conservation measures. The blue-green recovery road has faith in the genius of our species, our powers of innovation, and our ability to share ideas and resources. Dear colleagues, as you commence your discussions today, please do so in the knowledge that you are contributing to the, po the positive momentum of SDG 14's implementation. Yes, the super year has been disrupted, and all our key conferences have been postponed, but no more than that. They will be held, and in the meantime, we have a responsibility to maintain the momentum and meet the targets set by international agreement. I give us examples. SDG 14.5s demand that we conserve 10% of coastal and marine areas by 2020. And SDG 14.6s demand that we eliminate harmful fisheries subsidies before the end of this year. These targets are enticingly within reach. So let us renew all available efforts to achieve them. Dear colleagues, 
Gathered here in the virtual space of the International Ocean Governance Forum, we know the ocean will look after our needs as long as we treat it with respect. To do so, whether within our EEZs or out on the high seas, we must apply the best of our governance abilities through science-based planning and diligent management processes. Hopefully, it will not take another pandemic to drive home the message that we're all in this together, that Homo sapiens has only one planet on which to live, and that we must govern our place upon it with greater skill and diligence, a goal that is clearly only going to be achievable through regional and multilateral cooperation. So more power to you all in your deliberations at this timely forum. I thank you. Thank you very much. And now we will go to Veronica Vex, who is uh, from the European Commission, DG Mare. Uh, she is the Director for International Ocean Governance and Sustainable Fisheries at DG Mare. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see her now. Uh, welcome, Veronica, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Sheila, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of the oceans and the seas. Welcome to the first International Ocean Governance Forum, also from the side of the European Commission Services uh, Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. Unfortunately, this first uh, meeting of the Ocean Governance Forum has to take place in a different format than initially foreseen. In view of the circumstances created by the coronavirus epidemic, we decided to convert the physical meetings into webinars to allow the stakeholder forum for the future of our oceans to commence its work and to keep the momentum on ocean governance and on the sustainable development goal 14. I'm really glad to see that so many have followed our invitation, regardless of this change in format. And I do hope that everybody is well connected and can see and hear me. Apologies also today to those who have uh, been uh, in the webinars the two days before, because I will be repeating myself. So to start with, let me explain why we organized this forum. The establishment of a stakeholder forum dedicated to oceans and seas worldwide is based on the joint communication on international ocean governance adopted by the commission and the high representative in 2016. The communication identifies three strategic priorities for safe, secure, clean and sustainably used oceans, and hence for achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 14. They are improving the international ocean governance framework, reducing pressures and facilitating sustainable blue economy, and strengthening international ocean research and data. The communication identifies 50 actions to achieve these objectives. The Stakeholder Forum for International Ocean Governance is one of them. This forum uh, builds on the achievements of the European Union's International Ocean Governance Policy over recent years. The first progress report on the implementation of this plan of action for the future of our oceans shows that we are well on track in implementing our policy. Oceans are increasingly on the international agenda. There is growing recognition that clean, healthy and productive oceans and seas are key for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And there is growing recognition that clean, healthy and productive oceans and seas are a prerequisite for sustainable blue economy. This is even more true in times where we have to prepare for blue, green a sustainable recovery after the COVID-19 crisis. It is evident that we need to upscale our efforts to strengthen ocean governance and its implementation to ensure clean, healthy and productive oceans and seas for the futures. This view that more needs to be done is also shared by the European Union's member states. As you can see also on the slide on the uh, Council conclusions on oceans and seas of last November. These conclusions also welcome the establishment of the Stakeholder Forum and support the follow-up and further development of the European Union's ocean governance agenda. So what's the scope? What are the objectives of the forum? With this forum, we want to provide an open and transparent platform for stakeholders within Europe and beyond. 
to share understanding, to share experiences and to share good practice. We want to get ideas, your ideas, for future actions to tackle the global challenge of ocean sustainability. Discussions in this forum will feed our own reflections on how to step up our ocean governance policy and how to deliver on our sustainability objectives at the European Union level as laid down in the European Green Deal and at the global scale, notably those set by Sustainable Development Agenda 30, 2030. The forum has three thematic working groups based on three pillars of our international ocean governance agenda that you saw on the first slide. There are some horizontal topics such as climate change, which will be discussed in each of the three groups. This should allow to consider them under different angles. The same is true for enabling factors like capacity building or funding in light of the transversal relevance. Results from the discussions in the three groups will be brought together to feed into further discussions. Now let's move to the thematic group today, which is dedicated to strengthening international ocean research, data and knowledge. For the European Union, scientific evidence, innovation, research and ocean observation are crucial cornerstones to underpin the conservation and sustainable use of our oceans. Healthy oceans, seas, coastal and inland waters are a core mission under Horizon Europe, which is the European Union's research program. The European Union's comprehensive marine data management infrastructure, including, for, for instance, uh, the Copernicus Marine Environment uh, Monitoring Services, or the European Marine uh, Observation and Data Network called uh, EMODNET, is continu continuously further developed and represents state of the art. So for this webinar, there are a couple of questions uh, for, uh, to, to be looked at. Building on the European Union's efforts, we are curious now to see how to strengthen and support best ocean observation in other parts of the world, like the Global South. How to improve cooperation to advance global and multidisciplinary data collection? Which research alliances should be built next? These are some of the questions, and there are certainly more questions I hope you will consider this afternoon, and I really do for, look forward to your comments and reactions. So at this stage, I will not go further uh, into details and leave uh, time for more detailed presentations, uh, um, in particular by the discussion paper by Sheila. I wish you a very good session and look forward to the results of your discussions. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very much Veronica. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of this. So what I'm going to be discussing in the, in the very first part of this is really just the introduction to the document that, that we sent you. Um, and that document is the discussion paper um, that basically shows you the key challenges, opportunities, the consultation questions, and the future prospects that we have for EU action. And of course, we must remember that here, this is really about international ocean research data and knowledge. The first two webinars were more about the, um, the sort of blue economy and about, uh, about the governance part of this, but this is really about the data that underpins this, this uh, blue economy uh, and, and underpins the governance. So what we have in this document is really just a starting point for debate. Um, it was written by the consortium and with the support from um, from the Commission, they've, they've actually given us some review and we have had um, reviews from external people, some of whom will be presenting today. So you, you can also ask them questions about that. Um, so let's think about the role of ocean science um, in international ocean governance. So this is, a, doc, this is a, a graph that I quite like to use because it really shows you where ocean science sits in this whole framework. Um, as scientists, mostly what we're interested in is going out to sea and collecting data, building models and so forth. So we're really interested in the data and information part of the, of the orangey part of this figure. Um, but really what we need to do in order to underpin ocean governance is we need to turn that information into evidence, which can then be held, used to, to address policy questions, which could then basically lead into the international ocean governance that's needed. So, in order to address sustainable development goals, the UN decade for ocean science for sustainable development, that kind of thing, we really need 
to take the stuff that we want to do and turn it into something that um, is more useful for policymakers. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. We're talking about the whole um, value chain. We're not just talking about the, um, the, the data and information. And that's something we have to remember. So we had to, in the, in the document, have a definition for ocean science. And what we used is the, the definition that comes out of the Global Ocean Science Report. Um, which basically includes all of the disciplines from the hard sciences, physical, biology, chemistry, and so forth, to the humanities, the soft sciences, social sciences, engineering, as, as well as any multidisciplinary combination of those, as well as transdisciplinary science as well. So it's everything that's got to do with the ocean, people using the ocean, people needing the ocean. Um, and we are trying to understand the complex multi-scale systems that basically um, has to do with the ocean and all of that requires observations, modeling and other forms of knowledge, knowledge creation. So the objective then is to understand how the system works. That's basically the objective of ocean science. We want to know how it works, how it changes over time, how it responds to natural and anthropogenic pressures. That's what we want to do. And we want to assess the status of the ocean's ecosystems and resources in order to make sustainable use decisions. That's how we want to use the ocean research in this context. So um, the applications for governance that we have foreseen in the document, and you are more than welcome to give us more, is basically how we understand how the ocean influences climate change and how it, it, um, it is impacted and responds to climate change, as well as other stressors, other human uses. Uh, we want to assess ocean resources and, the, and their sustainable exploitation. We want to, want to understand the interactions between the uses of the ocean um, under the blue economy and we want to protect um, ocean ecosystems and ecosystem services and understand the resilience of the ocean to these pressures. That's kind of in a nutshell where we're going here. The ambitions for this work package is basically, and the focus is basically to highlight the challenges and opportunities that we have to make ocean research, research more responsive to the, the needs of decision makers. Um, how are we better able to support management of human pressures? And this links obviously to the um, theme, thematic working group one, which is on ocean, international ocean governance, where we're trying to um, improve the responsive backbone for the governance. And it's linked to thematic working group two, where we're really trying to provide the knowledge that underpins the blue economy. And over, obviously overall, this strengthens, it's there to strengthen the international ocean knowledge system that supports the UN 2030 um, agenda with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the European Commission's Green Deal. So uh, for the rest of the day, we're basically going to be uh, discussing these five topics. We will have first Julian Barbier talking about science society policy interface. Jorn Schmidt will talk about um, ocean research. Uh, George Petty Harkis will talk about ocean observations. Martin Visbeck about improving um, alliances. And then Sarah Garavelli will uh, talk about supporting data frameworks and ocean services. So um, they will all go through a part of that um, uh, part of that document and give their um, opinions on that. Um, and then the way we will do it is we'll have about five minutes for them to present and then about nine to ten minutes for everybody to uh, to ask questions. So please put your questions in the question and, and answer session uh, um, section and we will address them there. Uh, here is a question I'm assuming it's from Linwood Pendleton. It's also worth examining specifically whether international governance processes can be improved, not changed, or just tweaked, so they are, be so they are better able to use science and data. Uh, this would work best with a cross-working group um, team between working group one and three. I completely agree. Um, I think that would be a, a, a very good thing, and I think we will probably do that uh, at at a later st stage in the, uh, in the forum. Then question by Anne Turkman. Specific training programs are necessary to uh, establish ocean data literacy, uh, and we need a comprehensive training program to address that. What kind of actions are being planned, executed on this particular matter so far? Uh, to be honest, I don't know that that is really part of the International Ocean Governance Forum package for sure it's important and of course most um there is a lot of ocean uh, literacy um projects going on both with uh, with the european commission 
uh, who has through Digimari an ocean literacy project as well as with the IOC. So there's a lot of ocean literacy there. Um, and I think that we, this will be addressed, certainly it will be addressed as one of the important ways of in, uh, enabling um, society to participate in ocean data uh, collection and so forth um, during the course of our work. Question from Fabian, I think, Fabian, Fabian Jacques. Action have to be made at all steps, deploy more equipment at sea, collect data, develop models, develop indicators. I completely agree with you, Fabian. I think we have to do that, but we have to do it in a, um, in, in a way where we actually uh, can make sure that it answers the questions that the policymakers need. I'm not saying we don't need models for the sake of modeling. I love that. That's what I do. But in this specific case, I think we really need to make sure that we have all of this information to try and feed into the international ocean governance. She has a, before jumping from science to policy, we need to make all these steps sustained and operational. I completely agree with that as well. One of the biggest problems we have is that our observations are not sustainable, sustained. And so that's something that we really need to, to include. Um, we need to make sure that all of this is, it, it is properly funded. Otherwise, you know, we have a problem as we've had as we have at the moment with the corona crisis where our, our research vessels can't go out to pick up our Argo floats and so forth. And so we're having some problems even getting our weather forecast done properly because we've run out of the, the usual suspects um, collecting the data in the ocean. So these things really need to look, be looked at to make sure that that's sustainable. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you guys and I'm going to ask Julian Barber. And Julian is the head of marine policy and regional coordination at uh, the IOC, at the International Ocean Commission, Oceanographic Commission from, of UNESCO. He is obviously leading the preparation phase for the Ocean Decade for, um, for Sustainable Development, the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And um, thank you very much, Julian. Well, thank you very much, dear colleagues. And thank you, Sheila, for, for introducing me and, and of course, for inviting me to this uh, to this uh, dialogue and, and of, co of course providing me the opportunity to introduce uh, the topic of ocean science society policy interface. And um, let me first maybe highlight uh, that I think the word society in there uh, in this triptych is absolutely critical. And somehow I think it, it actually reflects a paradigm change. When I joined the UN a couple of decades ago, yes, that long, uh, the term used was science policy interface and, and decision makers, policy makers were supposed to talk to scientists and technical ex experts and very often uh, uh, societal actors uh, were out of these exchanges and, and, and really much uh, on the margin. So I think today there is clearly a global recognition that society and the multitude of societal actors uh, have a role to play in, in the achievement of the Agenda 2030 in ocean sustainability and of course in ocean governance. I think never more than in these extraordinary times, governments and society as a whole is turning to science to find credible answers, for example, to overcome the, the COVID crisis. Uh, similarly, as the ocean uh, is rapidly changing in ways we are not yet fully understanding or predicting, of course, action can only be effective if it is based on sound knowledge informed by science which is accessible and usable and, and relevant to the needs of end users. So a better understanding of the whole ocean ecosystem, the oceanic processes, the ecosystem, the, the people interaction is of course uh, urgently needed to ensure uh, uh, this responsible global stewardship, uh, but also to, uh, to, to, to get society to, to meet its, uh, uh, its, its goals. In a sense, I think this is what an effective science society policy interface can deliver. And our challenge, uh, as it has been set in the context of this forum, is really about making ocean research more responsive and actionable to the needs of decision maker and, and society. And of course, how we build uh, this interaction process, I would say is probably as important as the knowledge and the actions itself that we are uh, hoping to, to, to trigger. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, the, your, your discussion paper identifies uh, as a strategic objective the need to uh, have a comprehensive approach to co-design of marine research and in order to translate and embed scientific knowledge into policy measures. And of course, this is a, a goal that uh, uh, is very much uh, relevant 
uh, to all aspects of ocean sustainability. And of course, we are not starting from scratch. We do have a number of global processes, whether it is the IPCC, the recent uh, uh, report produced on, on ocean, the cryosphere, the IPBES, uh, focusing on, on ecosystem services and biodiversity, the World Ocean Assessment, which is in its second phase and, and will be uh, published at the end of this year. But, and of course, all of those uh, global initiatives are somehow overlapping. At the same time, we also have a number of regional initiatives with uh, also various degrees of engagement of end users and societal actors in the design of those uh, in interfaces. So I think there is a really a, a need uh, to federate different ocean communities into a much more integrated system uh, in order to generate this knowledge and to organize the integration of science uh, into, into public operation. We need to increase and improve cooperation with scientific bodies, uh, particularly strengthening the integration of social and human sciences. We need to also look at the issue of scale. Are we generating knowledge and information which is actually uh, uh, actionable from the uh, management perspective? Uh, we need to look at how we can really contain and package this information maybe more at the, at the national and subnational scales to really support those management efforts. And we also need to uh, look at new ocean governance frameworks, such as the BBNJ, where there will be a strong requirement for scientific inputs and a science policy interface, uh, which is, does not exist as we speak. So this is also very important developments that uh, uh, we need to address in the context of, uh, of these discussions. So what are the challenges that we are, uh, we are meeting in our task? So these slides provide some of those, how to better listen and respond to decision makers and citizens so we can really co-design the research, the data and the knowledge that, that, that they need. So what kind of uh, processes? Uh, what effective operational tools uh, can we put in place for ocean health monitoring, for example, in decision making at multiple scales, going from global to the EU and national and subnational scales? How to develop those uh, effective science society policy interface and ensuring that uh, those are designed to effectively use data and knowledge that are more evidence-based. How to develop joint learning processes and communication channels to pass on the, the, the scientific information to end users. How to integrate and transfer global to local scale ocean science into operational ocean services. And finally, how to strengthen citizen engagement and ocean literacy among decision makers uh, into a, a narrative that actually people are able to, uh, to grasp and understand. Let's look at the opportunities that, that we have in front of us. And, and of course, uh, a lot of uh, discussion uh, in the coming uh, months is, is very important. We talked about the superior of the ocean. Let's try to make this happen. But what are the opportunities? We need to probably federate and streamline different ocean communities at both regional and global levels into integrated systems for increased and improved ocean science policy cooperation. We need to integrate and support regional and international ocean assessments and, and strive towards more integrated assessments. We need to develop a strategic and comprehensive approach to co-design marine research uh, so that this knowledge is actually embedded into the regional and international policy measures. Strengthening ocean literacy is a requirement, clearly, uh, for both decision makers and, and citizens. Uh, more program for ocean education can be developed and, and more professional strains in, in science communication. This is clearly an area that requires a, a, a major investment. We need to address the issue of uh, open access to data and scientific publications. We know it's a major constraint. Uh, for uh, you know, generating some of this uh, integrated knowledge, and for that we need uh, to we need of course more incentives for researchers to make their results uh, and data uh, open access and support services for open access research and data. And of course we need stronger infrastructures, and this is also going to be discussed in the course of, uh, of of today to translate the research into actionable knowledge for decision makers and creating the new collaborations that we need to establish between the sciences, academia, and the private sector, uh, for example. Now, linked to this uh, topic, of course, I cannot uh, close my remark without mentioning the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which I'm sure some of you will know will run 
from 2021 to 2030. And of course, it's a global initiative in which the European Commission has been uh, engaged very actively. The Decade is a UN-wide initiative, but it's really focusing on the engagement of ocean actors around a set of common uh, actions and priorities. And we're talking about governments, we're talking about business and industry, the scientific community, policymakers, IGOs, regional organizations, NGOs, media, and so on. It has the overall goal of generating knowledge about the ocean to incite transformative action that will ensure that the ocean is fully contributes to sustainable development. It includes, of course, the fulfillment of SDG 14 and the other SDGs in the uh, 2030 agenda, uh, who also in which the ocean plays a critical role, whether it's in regards to, to food security, poverty, climate and energy. So essentially, the decade will act to produce the science we need that will catalyze a step change for the ocean we have. Uh, sorry, from the ocean we have to the ocean we want which is framed in terms of the six outcomes uh, on the right side of, uh, of the slide. In the context of a decade, the science we need include four major elements. It's really about generating and using knowledge around priority scientific issues. It's about developing and deploying uh, applications and services based on this knowledge. It's about mechanism to ensure knowledge is used for decision-making, policy, manage policy management and society as a whole, so very much align with the, the, the interface uh, uh, we're talking about here. And all of this, of course, needs to be underpinned by uh, capacity development and mechanisms to ensure equitable access to data, technology, and, and skills. So I think it's therefore very essential that the EU contributes uh, to ensure that the ocean decade will be successful in delivering the research, the data, and the knowledge needed to uh, inform international ocean government. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. So uh, just a reminder, these are the questions that we came up with uh, when we wrote the consultation document. So if anybody has any other questions, that'd be great to know. Um, but just uh, going, uh, I, as you were speaking, there's been some interesting questions that have come in. Um, one was on how can we include traditional knowledge, local ecological knowledge in um, in this, how is that included? Yeah, I mean, traditional knowledge has been identified uh, very much again, looking at the, the process of the decade as a, a, a priority area to be really integrated in the wider body of knowledge we are talking about uh, and we are trying to generate. How do we do this concretely, uh, working at the global scale, working at the local scale in really building this uh, uh, collaboration between the tra traditional indigenous knowledge uh, uh, generators and the traditional uh, I would say more physical or biological sciences uh, communities. Uh, that's, an, that's an area that, that requires further uh, development in terms of generating this, this new collaboration. And this is definitely something that we want to take on in the context of, uh, of the UN decade and specifically trigger actions uh, to, to, to do that, including, for example, in the area of, of data collection, uh, establishing monitoring principles uh, and so on. Okay, one more question from Serge Garcia. How do we support and maintain research capacity in the developing world? I had to ask that one. That, 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 that of course, deserves a, a very short answer. Thank you, Serge. Uh, I think there are different areas that where, where we need to invest. We clearly need to invest in, in you know, to build the human resources. Uh, and that, that kind of comes through different uh, array of, of activities. We also need to focus on a providing access to physical infrastructure established or that needs to be established. Uh, we need to also, I think, having uh, ocean research policies, which are developed in, which are, uh, you know, formalized in, in some of those countries. Uh, and of course, I think we need to help uh, those countries to really come up with uh, uh, tools for resource mobilizations in order to provide uh, in-kind and financial support to the capacity development uh, uh, objective. So self-driven capacity development is very important in this country. Thanks, Julian. So I think we will go now to our next speaker, which is Jorn Schmidt. So Jorn Schmidt is the lead of the research group on marine social ecological systems at the Center for Ocean and Society at Kiel University. Um, he, he holds the UNESCO chair in integrated marine science um, and is an adjunct professor at the Marine Affairs Program of Dalhousie University in Canada. So thank you very much, Jorn. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, very stimulating um, um, activity. I have to say that uh, 
the last two days were already very stimulating with respect to the interaction with the attendees. And I already uh, went through some of the questions and I could spend easily my five minutes now going into some of the interest, interesting ones, but I try to go through um, some of the aspects of the, of the paper as it's now uh, on supporting ocean research. And I would start that by going into a um, quote by Peter Horgan, who says that the goal is of course the provision, the provision of services while keeping the system in, in safe boundaries. And I think uh, that is, of course, a very anthropocentric view of the system, say, saying that, okay, we, we have, of course, the look at the system as what does it provide to us. But we need to do that while ensuring that um, the system stays within safe uh, boundaries. Um, Going now into the, um, the content of the paper. So we have outlined, or the paper outlines, a couple of challenges. And we just heard about the, the science society policy um, interface. And uh, to support, I think it's important that uh, to, we have to support a science society policy dialogue. And I, I need to stress it here because I just wrote science policy dialogue for a sustainable blue economy. And I think it's also important to um, realize that we are looking at it um, with a focus on the well-being of people uh, and not on a only sectorial industrial uh, from an industrial point of view. Um, and that leads us, this science society policy dialogue leads us into thinking, really trying to um, go forward with transdisciplinarity approaches. So going with co-design, co-production, and co-implementation. There have been a couple of comments already saying, and, and uh, I think Julianne uh, also expressed that, that is of course important that we take a full interdisciplinary approach, being aware of all the different disciplines that are relevant in this context. And this is the natural sciences together with the social sciences and the humanities, but also engineering, architecture, um, areas that uh, we maybe normally not think about. And how to bring that together with societal actors. Um, and there's different aspects on that. There's, of course, there's industry aspects in that, but there's, of course, of course community aspects. This is also where we have to think about uh, what has been mentioned um, a minute ago uh, about uh, local, um, traditional, and indigenous knowledge. And then, of course, we have to foster international collaboration to address these knowledge gaps and research priorities. And I think what is really important here is that we think about it as a, a true knowledge exchange um, on equal footing. And I think there are still areas, and, and we heard that before, uh, where we have to think about capacity development in areas where there might, you know, lack in infrastructure, lack in funding uh, abilities to support um, uh, research in, in specific areas. Uh, but we have to engage um, in knowledge exchange on equal footing. So not talking only about knowledge transfer, but uh, really uh, leveraging the, the, um, the collaboration on equal footing. And when we go further, and this is a bit restricted, of course, because it's looking at what has been outlined by the uh, paper Navigating the Future 5, Marine Science for a Sustainable Future by the Marine Board. Um, but I think we have heard that um, already in some of the, or we have read that in some of the questions and we have <laughs> read that uh, already yesterday and the day before is that we want or we need to understand multiple stresses. We need to understand cumulative effects, how um, different activities work in time and space, um, how uh, those, uh, and to understand that to develop ways to not only reduce them, but also to try to balance activities uh, with uh, so sustainable development of those activities with protection objectives that we have. Um, and then understanding ocean ecosystems, including humans for ecosystem-based management frameworks. And I think this is something where we have made a lot of progress. I mean, um, organizations like the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea uh, and others have really been um, working on and, and making progress on implementing or, or working on an ecosystem-based um, understanding that gives us the ability uh, to inform, to actually implement an ecosystem-based management framework. And then, of course, it is also about um, understanding extreme events to prevent loss and damage. And we have seen a lot of these examples in the past. And I think it's important to stress that it's uh, about um, fast onset um, events as well as slow onset events like sea level rise. So we are looking at, at uh, you know, things that are 
working on a very short time scales and things that are working on very long time scales where it's far more difficult to see the changes and, and adapt to these changes. And then, and this is also again something, and it's, it's very good to be the third uh, in the line of three um, uh, meetings. We have also heard or read um, to the, um, the importance to not only look at the ocean, but also to look at the coast, to look at the estuaries, and to look at the land, because there is a continuum. And there's, of course, um, things that are cross cutting uh, across these three um, uh, domains. Um, we do have a lot of opportunities. Again, applying transdisciplinary science approaches to generate knowledge for societal challenge. Um, and that means that we need to include different knowledge systems. And this is again to stress that, of course, we have the different disciplinary knowledge production systems. Uh, so it is fundamentally different how natural sciences um, produce knowledge as is social sciences and humanities. But it's important to also be uh, um, aware of all the other knowledge systems that exist and to incorporate them. So, and it's important, this is important to, to do this uh, together with societal actors to be relevant for society and thus also policy. Uh, develop smart ocean observing systems supported by maritime sectors and citizens. I think here again, and that uh, I just read a question about that, that we should really integrate or include um, sectors that are um, working in the maritime sphere to include them in data collection. And then there's a lot of emphasis over the last years about citizen science, but I think that we need to go beyond citizen science and, and actually um, get to a point where we have a community supported observation system that is, that is more inclusive and, and do that in a way that we inform um, society on things that are happening in the marine environment in a mean, on a meaningful scales. Uh, improve models and model frameworks to address trade of analysis, of course, again, we don't only focus on quantitative models, but also qualitative models. Um, support governance structures to consider trade-offs and increase resilience. Um, and we have heard about governance structures and in, about institutions. And again, I think it's important to strengthen those institutions which are working already in that realm uh, uh, and, and where we can build on those successes. And then it's important to also look again into communities and informal governance mechanisms uh, to support that. And then to develop training programs. And I, uh, this artificial intelligence is, of course, just one example, I think, of uh, areas where we need to think across disciplines and thinking outside the box. And um, the importance of artificial intelligence, of course, is, is popping up in a lot of areas. And this is just uh, one example of uh, cross-cutting issues that we need to look into. And with that, I'm uh, concluding on the consultation questions and I'm happy to answer questions or... Thank you very uh, much. Thanks, Jorn. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so as I said, the questions are there for this part. The first question I think uh, that we want to address to you is actually one that um, came up right in the beginning from Jake Rice. And it was basically, um, how do we enable social sciences to actually be part of the... Um, the picture. I think uh, it's, yeah, it's a very natural science focused group. So how do we, how, how do we do that? Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I try to answer very briefly the question in the chat window. And um, I totally agree, Jake, that it's very important that we um, get the different disciplines together. And, and as you might or might not know, um, and I think you haven't mentioned that at the beginning, I'm also very active in, in uh, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. And we have developed a strategic initiative on the human dimensions where we specifically uh, address this issue of a very natural science-based organization. How can we actually bring in the social sciences and humanities? And we are doing that not only there, but also on other, uh, in other uh, fora. And I think the most important part is, as we want to become societal relevant, uh, and I'm putting quotation marks about that because that might not be the interest every time because there's still a pure scientific interest, of course, and we need to pursue that. But if we go into the realm of societal relevance, then these need to be addressed by um, social sciences and humanities. And there needs to be this, this close collaboration. And I think it's a lot about bringing people together and learning different disciplinary languages to understand how the different disciplines work. Uh, but we have been making quite a bit of progress. And, and therefore, I totally agree, um, Jake, that we need to, to pick that up in the, in the document and be more explicit about how to do that. Thank you. Okay, and I think there's one more question that I think is worth asking. It, it also follows on from something that Jake asked. 
it's from Serge Garcia asking about how do we make decisions, um, how do we accelerate the skills of making decisions under imperfect information that are really already available? We need to make those decisions. The policymakers need the answers now. Um, how do we do that? Right, and I think that's a really important question. Um, however, I would argue that we are we are making decisions all the time with imperfect knowledge. I mean, decisions are being made. And the, the point about it is, how do we uh, make the knowledge available directly to the decision makers so that the uncertainty uh, under where, which these decisions are being, being taken is actually at least informed by the knowledge that we have. And I think this is important. And we see that now in the current uh, crisis, um, very prominently and very differently in, in, in different countries. But I have to say um, that we have seen that, of course, the scientific system is also challenged when asked to deliver something in a very short time. And I think that both sides need to learn, first, first of all, learning what it doesn't mean to take decisions under uncertainty. And secondly, how can science really react in a, in a manner uh, that we're not getting entangled in all these uncertainties ourselves? Because then we tend to say, oh, we cannot really give you an information here because we need to do more research and we, we don't have the time. So we, we, we need to learn. And I think this is also something where, um, again, the social sciences and, and humanities can actually um, help in, in, in doing that because there is research on this, um, there's a lot of research on post-normal science that is including aspects like that. And there's a lot of research under uh, decision-making and under uncertainty. So I, I totally agree uh, that this is an important point, but there's ways of doing that, but we do need to, um, to educate the people that are involved in the system to, to really be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next speaker is going to be George Pediakis. He is the research director at the Hellenic Center for Marine Research and the head of, of the observation component of Poseidon. Um, and he is the chair of the executive board of Eurogoose and a member of the steering committee of the European Ocean Observing System. So George, your five minutes starts now. Good afternoon, everybody from Crete at the eastern part of the Mediterranean, just to locate myself ocean wise. And uh, this presentation is about how we can strengthen ocean observations. And I would like to start with uh, a general uh, comment, uh, which shows the importance of ocean observing and the strategic approach that is required if we're going to be in line with the UN 2030 agenda, but also on the adaptation and mitigation of climate change impacts, the prevention of the transgression of planetary boundaries, and the achievement of the SDGs. Observations today are the backbone of ocean and weather forecast and projections and for the global uh, climate system and their optimal spatial and temporal resolution across the global ocean will hopefully reduce uncertainties. Now, if we move to challenges, uh, one major challenge that we face today is the fragmentation with inefficiencies in planning sharing of data and best practices, resources, etc. And uh, in this system, user needs, in this fragmented system, user needs are not heard and not met. And there is a lack of coordination and a lack of a common strategy. Uh, an important uh, challenge is the lack uh, of financial sustainability. And from a recent work of Eurogus on behalf of EEA, we see that uh, Ocean observations are under threat, and only 28% of total observation observing systems are sustainable, with most, most of them uh, having a very short period of certainty, one to, two, four, one to four years, which is a very small period. And if we want to compare with what happens in the meteorology, we see a big difference, a difference of 40%, with only 28% of ocean observation being sustained compared to a 68%. And this is a big, big difference. Uh, there is a lack of capacity in the global south. We can see that in pictures like the one on the right. And uh, although deep observations are key to understanding important processes, such as the contribution of ocean vertical mixing to go global uh, warming, we know that deep areas are uh, very difficult to, to reach. Also, the coastal ocean 
is the most productive and dynamic part of the world ocean and thus a very significant, we can say, source in terms of resources and services for, uh, for mankind. But it's a very complex system and this complexity is also reflected to our observing efforts, which uh, requires multiple platforms with different capabilities. Uh, moving to the last slide of challenges, uh, we see that uh, although for the ocean observing system, need, we need to integrate all, proper, all properties of the ocean, such as physical, chemical, and biological, but today we know that global ocean observations predominantly include physical and biogeochemical parameters. The further development of biological observations and observations of human activities is a key challenge if we want to better understand the associated pressures and their impact on the ocean. Uh, exchanges of practices, standardized measurements under fair principles and technology transfer are all key components against fragmentation. And finally, gaps in coverage of bathymetric uh, surveys needs to be addressed. Moving to opportunities, having seen the challenges, what are the opportunities today, or at least some of the opportunities, the important opportunities? Uh, we can start with a vision from the GOO strategy, which is, uh, is talking about a truly integrated global ocean observing system that delivers the essential information needed for our sustainable development, safety, well-being, and prosperity. And in Europe, uh, a coordinated framework to align and integrate the European Ocean Observing Capacity uh, is necessary. And this is the European Ocean Observing System, which has been, uh, we have seen the efforts in the last few years, and it's the mechanism which we think will minimize fragmentation and most importantly, allow, will allow a shared vision and a shared strategy uh, for Europe. We need to make more observations in the global south, but also in certain basins. And this here I have an example of the Mediterranean where you can see the sparsity of effort of observations in the south. Uh, sustain funding is a major challenge, as I said, and uh, for our observing systems and drastic actions are needed towards increasing the percentage of secure funds. Long-term observations are of paramount importance for climate, and we cannot afford to lose uh, systems that have been operating, observing systems that have been operating for long, but also we cannot afford to have periodic operation of systems. We need to improve our capacity on biological observations. Uh, establishing essential variables for biology will possibly concentrate efforts and give a signal and a guidance to manufacturers for automated uh, sensors. And we need to develop links between the different communities, such as the operational uh, oceanography with uh, the communities uh, which operate at a regional base, like the regional conventions. The last uh, slide on the, my opportunities is about improving ocean technologies, where innovative technologies are necessary. Uh, Low-cost plug-and-play sensors that can be used across different platforms, systems that can communicate between them and exchange information in real time, and autonomous, autonomous platform with adapting capability thing that will contribute to a step change in ocean observing. And finally, we need to increase efforts to make bathymetric survey data sets available from all different sources. And I would like to finish with uh, the OceanOBS conference uh, summary, which states that through meaningful partnerships, we continue to build a sustainable ocean observing system that will generate knowledge for society. With timely, reliable, and accessible information, ocean interactions can be maintained sustainably and society will prosper. And with this, I finish. Thank you, Silva. Thank you very much, George. Again, you guys should see the consultation questions there. If you have any others, um, that'd be great. Um, there's a few questions that came in before that I, I, I'm going to ask you, George. Let's see how you answer them. The first one is from Jean-Francois Bonin. 
from SRT Marine. It's a private company. And he says, um, from a private company's point of view, who is helping government to put in place tools for a better management of marine resources? And how can we implement a more easy, more easy technology transfer between universities and private, private companies and government? I know it's a difficult one, but I thought you would be able to answer it. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try. I think th this is a real challenge that we have faced many, many times. And uh, despite our efforts through research projects, basically, to bridge or to bring uh, this together, the research uh, with the industry, we haven't been successful. I think we have to be more, we have to employ more innovative mechanisms. In the past, we have tried conferences, uh, or exhibitions trying to sit together and uh, design together. But certainly there is a, a gap there. There is a need, which, as I said, we need to find innovative ways how to can bridge that. But for sure, this is something, or this is a top priority if we're going to move successfully in the future. And if, as we need more technology, it's the industry which obviously will have to bring this. I, I might um, offer a, a suggestion here, actually. Um, when I was in the UK, I was, we were part of a, um, a, a group that actually trained um, engineers, marine engineers, in what marine ecosystems are. And, and they, so they had this engineering PhD fellowship whereby engineers would actually be trained, come to a marine institute and be trained for two weeks. And this, this whole... Um, fellowship uh, was actually that the, the, the engineering students who were PhDs and engineers actually worked at the marine technology um, companies. They had a, a placement there. So I think that is one way that would actually, and certainly in that case, there was a lot of uh, very good information transfer that happened. So that is something that maybe we can think about um, at the EU level, I think, which would be quite interesting. Um, and then there was one other question that I wanted to ask if I can find it again. The problem with these questions are that they jump around. Uh, one from Christine Valentin, who asks, how do we develop an organized approach to engage industry in being more systemic and proactive in tra um, transforming their in infrastructures in knowledge and data providers? So how do we actually engage so so the first question was from the from the um industry side but now maybe from the academic side how do we actually make it easier from our side to engage with them so that we can make sure that we actually um you know transfer that data between um, the companies and and research organizations yes i think co-design co um uh, it's it's an important step mm -hmm. co-design and also, uh, the, in the last few years, there has been this opening of infrastructures to outside. So research infrastructures that have been built for research uh, reasons, for research, for serving uh, research, basically. Now they are opening and they are opening uh, to industry as well. And we have a great, uh, quite a lot of examples uh, through many different European projects that actually industry comes in they do uh, their experiment, they use our infrastructures and we share data and we work together. Okay, there are obviously several limits as to, especially on the data sharing, but I think we can slowly, slowly overcome those things. But it takes time and uh, absolutely it's something that we need to, to work on in the, in the very, very near future. Okay, thank you very much, George. So I think we shall go to the next speaker, uh, which is Martin Visbeck. Um, everybody knows him. He's the head of research uh, of the physical oceanography unit um, of GMR. And he's a professor at Kiel University. Uh, he led the Atlantos project and he serves on the executive planning group for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and on the assembly support that is supporting the development of the UN Horizon Europe Ocean Mission. So, Martin, your uh, five minutes start now. Yes, uh, Sheila, thank you very much. And so uh, I'm, I've been asked to speak about uh, improving research alliances. And uh, I think this is a very interesting topic. And I want to ask the question a bit, why do we have research alliances and what does that have to do with ocean governance? And some of you have heard me speak about what I call the ocean value chain which kind of connects the various even uh, interventions we had this morning, 
uh, with uh, kind of the activities uh, that we are doing collectively in the framework of ocean governance, but also in ocean sciences. And the way I look at it, it's, it's a circle, so you can start anywhere. I mean, this morning uh, we started with Julian talking a bit more about the policy and governance and science and policy interface. But I'm going to start with observing that we just heard. Uh, discovery observing is important. But then it's important to make sure that the data and information flows into an understanding and develops knowledge, different forms of knowledge, academic knowledge, practical knowledge, uh, private sector knowledge, NGO knowledge, and so on. In some parts of uh, our understanding allows us to do modeling and projections, so that's great. And that then really needs to feed back into society in ways in which society can react to. And sometimes we use assessments for that. Think about the climate assessment, IPCC, or the best platform for biodiversity, and many others along those lines. And mostly only then is the policy system and the governance system willing to react to findings, understanding, or knowledge. So in some ways, uh, these research alliances are trying to bring this circle, this value chain together in, 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 in to spin it into action in a more integrated way. So now let me just show you uh, the ones that you might be more familiar with. For example, we have the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, so these, both of them cover uh, the Belém and Galway statements. We have something more in the Baltic region, it's the Banos Bonus activity in the Mediterranean, the Blue Med, and also the Black Sea Connect. So these are the kind of research alliances that we have on the European level. But on the other hand, uh, we have other actors in that space. Uh, we already discussed CMEMS, the Copernicus Marine Environmental Services, but there's also the conventions, OSPA Helcom in our areas, but also the ISIS, PISIS, SISM, fisheries type of organizations, quite a few of them. And again, these alliances have to also be connecting to some of the activities there. But moreover, uh, we have global actors, uh, the Division of uh, the Law of the Sea and the IOC UNESCO. Julian spoke a little bit about it, but it's also the fisheries uh, and agricultural organization, FAO, the United Nations Environment Program, which is the regional seas effort, the International Maritime Organization, the World Meteorological Organization, and others. And again, these research alliances also have to connect into these global actor space. And last but not least, there's a number of them that speak to what we just heard about observing system kind of activities, the global ocean observing system, where the Europeans are contributing to through EOS. There's the Atlantic strategy that developed through the Atlantis project, but there's also Moon Goose for the Mediterranean and Arcus for the Arctic. So these are the regional alliances for observing as such. But in some sense, the question then is, uh, so these features, alliances, what really is their form and functions and how can we bring them into a more active uh, activities? So I think what are the challenges? And I think the first thing you might wanna do if you think about improving or growing a new regional alliance, what is the value proposition? You really have to think about that very hard. Are they well articulated? What are the objectives? What are you trying to do? and really think about avoiding duplication and overlap. We have a lot of organizations in the ocean space. Some say way too many. So when you think there is room and space for a new uh, research alliance, really think about that and think about cooperation. So sometimes there's a possibility for research alliances to bring together existing activities, like through the conventions, like regional observing system, operational observing systems, but also the data dimension, like EMOTNET, Blue Cloud, uh, we heard and we heard more about, and also the observing communities as such. And the paper goes a little bit into that. Uh, I've given you a picture from Atlantos uh, strategy. The Atlantos program really looks into a more holistic view of how ocean observations can be used in forming the observing system as such, then go into data portals and data delivery and information systems that then gets to society. So again, a value chain type of thinking, but research alliances are really trying to optimize these processes and bring them all together. So I think that's a, a, an important aspect, but really think about the goal. Well articulated a goal for research alliances are really critical. I want to use now one dimension of it, and there could be many ones we heard about observing. So I'm going to do a preview on data and then as one example. I'm personally quite excited about the possibility in the next decade or so to really build up more what I'm going to call a digital twin ocean. The commission talks about the digital twin earth. 
And I think I'm going to call this Ocean 5D. So the idea would be, how about a research alliance of partners, private sector, academic, the users, so civil society, to really generate a five-dimensional ocean? What do I mean by that? The four dimensions are time is one and three space dimensions. We know all of that. But the fifth dimension is kind of issue. Where can I do fish farming? How can I manage my coastal zone? Where is the carbon? What is the warming? How about coral reefs? Where's opportunities for uh, more energy from the ocean, like wind farming? And I think these types of things give you the opportunity to really network all of the data. How do we get there? Well, it's a statement about working together. It's about interoperability of the data. Data have to be fair. It's about data harvesting, not only in the research community, but also with private actors, civil society, equitable, trust, a lot of elements around it. But if you do it, it could be a great work between international sciences, civil society, the private sector, uh, and many other actors, government, education, and so on. And I think it would enable a new way of cooperation, of federation of the kind of things we do into an interface that can be accessed by many actors. It's one of these ways where research corporations can really lead to a product. So now let me summarize a little bit where I see the opportunities sit. And on the right side, you see a graphic that Lindbergh, uh, uh, Karen Evans, and myself just published as a contribution to the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It talks about the many dimensions and opportunities around ocean science and forming sustainable development. And ocean governance is certainly an element of that. But I think the opportunities really are to mobilize the existing alliances to really increase our understanding of the ocean as all its dimensions. And the paper does talk about that. I call this Ocean 5D. But also we might think about, are there opportunities for new alliances that have not have been formed so much? We've been getting a lot of successes about this regional scale, the Atlantic scale, the Mediterranean scale, the Arctic scale, the Baltic Sea scale. So what about the European connectivity to the Indian Ocean, to the colleagues in the Pacific and the Southern Ocean? Well, we can explore that. But I also think it's ex extremely important that whenever we think about these research alliances to, uh, to make it more equitable, to think about capacity building, to think about literacy, to think about full engagement with all the actors. This is for me easy to say and not so easy to do, but a full participation of those around us who are not as resourced as we or some of us are would be really good. But last but not least, it's really important that research alliance work in a transdisciplinary way. All the speakers have said that so far. And they really need to be inclusive to all of the dimensions of science, natural science, social science, humanities, law, economic, and so on, but also inclusive of other forms of knowledge, the more practical, uh, traditional, and community knowledge. So I think there's actually good opportunities for improving research alliances along these lines. And I think the digital opportunities in particular one that personally I'm quite excited about. So Sheila, back to you. Here are the questions uh, that you provided me with you, and I'm looking forward to maybe some of the questions that you might ask or the colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, Martin. Um, so yes, we have a few questions, uh, and I am going to... Uh, so there was a question from Rebecca Hubbard, um, which I, I'm, I think you were at the webinar yesterday as well, Martin. The question is, do you think that there could be more development of alliances to focus on the ocean biodiversity climate nexus to improve knowledge for policy and decision making? That's an excellent question. Uh, but I would say uh, some of the activities like in the Atlas program as an example, but also some of the all Atlantic activities are really trying to do that. So I think we're really advancing from a state that we might have been a decade ago where we were looking more at physical systems, chemical systems, biogeochemical systems, and ecological systems in separation. And I think there's now more and more a move towards more fully integration to really take advantage of sharing platforms, sharing data streams, agreeing on interoperable activities, but also really being able now to look at the ocean as a system with all its components. And I think some of the bigger questions like, how are we gonna address climate change? How are we gonna tackle the loss of biodiversity? What are sustainable blue economy options? Really need those data to also be multidisciplinary and inclusive 
but also not forgetting the social science dimension out of it and the data that go beyond that. So what are the economic de demands from the coastal communities? What are the issues around pollution? What are the, the, the sort of negative impacts also in an economic sense? So really that has to be brought together in a more holistic way. So I thank you for the question, but I will say there's a lot of activity in that direction supported by the European Commission, by the European community as such, and really we should really go along those paths as much as we can. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm going to ask a question that isn't actually coming from it because it's a question I want to ask. And it's one that's on this uh, consultation questions. How do we enable the global South to fully participate in research alliances uh, when there's such a discrepancy in capacity? I think um, I, those of you who know me, I'm actually from Southern Africa, so I know how difficult it is. And um, it's not to be underestimated how hard it is for people in, in the global south to actually participate in these. So how do we make sure that we actually engage with them on an equitable basis? Yeah. So um, I think Sheila, thanks again. And I think you also was in the chat box uh, quite a few times and uh, I have it also down, down here. And to me, this is a critical aspect. I mean, the ocean is a global system. Jörn shot that wonderful picture that see how we're all connected, which also means that our understanding, generation of data, information, and knowledge also needs to be done, shared in an equitable way. But what that really means is that some of us who come from the more endowed regions, like myself from Germany, maybe at times we need to step back a bit, slow down a bit, and really bring ourselves into those regions and actively discuss and talk to the colleagues there and see what their concerns, challenges are and how we can make progress together. So for me, that is also a big part of listening to the concerns, but also hearing where the opportunities and steps are that we can go together. Uh, Sheila, I mean, before the lockdown, I've been in Cape Town and specifically discussed that issue with uh, the Southern African partners and friends. And it's really interesting to hear how much engaged they are and what they're bringing forward at the level that, that, that they can. But there's also developments about cheaper sensors, about it really opening in a more equitable way all the information to come in and to really value every bit of it and not just dominate it by the high tech high cost solution. So I think there is ways in which to do it, but I think it means that we who have come from the more endowed parts of the world need to step back a bit, slow down a bit, listen more, and really look for these joined up opportunities. Yeah, I think, um, I actually think that it's quite important that you don't just go there with the questions you want to answer, but ask them the questions they want to answer, because it's often you have different, you come at it from different angles. And if you answer the questions that are more important for them, you might actually get to a better place and then you have, you know, better engagement. So I think there's definitely something to be said for that. Um, then there is a question from Nick Hartman Montfort. Um, uh, inclusivity has been mentioned a lot and it's good to see strong thought um, about the global south. Please, could the panel also address gender inclusi inclusivity in marine sciences and how this can be enabled? Well, there is a question that's right up my, uh, my alley. <laughs> so, Sheila, that's a question for both of us. I mean, I honestly was a little bit, I almost bailed from this one because there was no woman on the panel, but now there is one. She's going to speak in a minute and you're moderating. That's wonderful. But I do think it is something we really need to be paying more attention to. It's diversity across many dimensions. Gender is one of them, but it's also age. There's early careers uh, which are in our community, which have fascinating insights into what we're trying to do. So I really thank you for that question. It is something we always have to keep in our minds to really make sure that we bring forward our experts and, and insights from the various parts of our enterprise. And, and diversity is really the key to better solutions, better answers, and that goes across many dimensions and gender is one of them. Okay. and. Um... There was one other comment actually in the chat box from, and that's a really a valid point, your, your 5D ocean. Um, it's, it's basically that uh, the 5D is actually already being used by some sectors like the seabed seismic analysis, which they're referring to 3D plus time and variables. I guess it's the same, it's basically the same thing as what you're saying. Variables in this case is just the issue you're talking about. 
Yes, so and I have no copyright on the 5D and I'm not <laughs> claiming it. Uh, and I also don't have copyrights on digital twin. That's a very popular term in engineering, mm -hmm. but I'm just trying to use it uh, in, a, in a way to really uh, accomplish one thing. And that is, I really want us to move as a community from niche to norm. And what that really means is we got to deliver information, knowledge and services that everybody wants. And if that's the case, then we're going to see a shift in engagement on the finances. We just heard about the Global Ocean Observing System that in meteorology, the atmosphere is 70% sustained funded and the ocean it's 30 or maybe 40. So how do we get to that 70? And I think that's the niche to norm issue. And I think Ocean 5D and issues like that really generate the pull for sustained observing and data coming from the ocean and then the funding will follow suit. I don't think we're gonna make much headway by arguing this is sort of what we need. We really have to show what we can do and gen generate uh, the support with that. Thank you very much. Ah, there's a one from Fabian Jack. What's the difference between Ocean 5D and Twin Ocean? Is it uh, an existing initiative? Yep, so um, all of it is uh, in semi parts existing. So the digital twin ocean is sort of the ocean version of the digital twin earth. And the digital twin earth is part of the European digital strategy. Uh, if you look at some of the documents that came out uh, just a few months ago from the commission, it talks about our digital common heritage or our digital future. And in that document, it speaks about the digital twin earth as one of the objectives. I just feel, okay, we're the ocean community, so we could maybe produce the ocean part of the digital twin earth, and I'm just calling that Ocean 5D. Okay, um, and then from Kay von Schuckmann, um, and it's about uh, how can we provide, can we provide comments on the needs for data to, to improve our models? Um, I guess it's quite important that uh, you know, in order to actually get to the digital twin or the 5D ocean, as you were calling it, we really need to, to have models to, to try and get there. Um, so how do we make sure that we have enough data? Well, you can, of course, create the models without the data, but... <laughs> yeah, so, so Karina von Zuckmann, thank you very much. She works at CMEMS, and uh, I think what she's basically saying, yes, there's a number of different uses for data and information observations. Some of them, you're just going to produce a, a database product and, and, and you guys do that, but also quite often, it's better to put it through the eyes of a model or through the interpolation power of a model, because that means that incomplete data sets together with the physics, chemistry, biology, ecology understanding can be made more complete and more holistic. So I think that's important. It's also clear when you want to run, let's say, dynamical ocean models, biogeochemical ocean models, ecology models, that quite often data are very critical uh, to improve them. But certainly they're very critical when you want to produce operational products, insights, or forecast. So there's many dimensions around that. And I think that is uh, what Jörn also mentioned as the co-creation and co-design also of observing systems, because they have to respond to all of these different user needs. And then finding the sweet spot, the essential ocean variable, the right mix of platforms to observe them is really something that the GOOS and EOS efforts are trying to do as best as they can. Uh, oh, the question from Kate Larkin. How can we create a more regular, robust mechanism to gather in, um, the international ocean governance user needs to make both, um, both ocean data collection and data services, so added value maps and so on, more fit for purpose for international ocean governance not just in Europe, but beyond? I think that is a very good question, uh, Kate, uh, because in, in many ways, uh, we, we see a lot of ocean governance on processes going on more in the legal domain. And I don't have a problem with that. But quite often, they would definitely benefit from more facts, information, and insights about the ocean system. And as, as Julian was saying, that's not a science policy interface. That's a society governing type of interface. And at times, uh, we, we don't speak always the same language in these circles. So I do think there's an opportunity to really uh, go back and forth uh, when we're de debating things like BB&J treaties or about you know, uh, other, uh, so let's say, permitting of economic activities, blue growth in the ocean, marine special planning. All of these governing activities also have a demand for data, uh, but sometimes uh, those groups who are advancing those 
are not so clearly articulating specifically what it is that they need from an ocean information data knowledge system. So I think the decade has really an opportunity to bring these communities a bit more better together and, and give more guidance to where emphasis or the need to close certain knowledge gaps is uh, the highest. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Now we've successfully gone over time again. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. So on our last speaker today um, is Sarah Garabelli. So Sarah is the Senior Project Manager and Shareholder at Trust IT, and she is the Blue Cloud Project Manager. She is a member of the European Ocean Science Cloud Communication Task Force, and she supports many European Ocean Science Cloud related projects. So it fo follows on really well from um, what, uh, what Martin has just been talking about. So Sarah, your five minutes start now. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Sheila, for the introduction and for the invitation. Okay, so today I'm introducing the theme related to the support and data frameworks and ocean services. Uh, we heard already about the importance of um, strengthening the ocean observation systems, uh, how key are the international collaborations, and the common objectives that we all have in transforming data into knowledge to increase the capacity to make informed decisions to support policymakers. So in order to do that, what we need are public, sustainable, but also operational data frameworks that can provide, let's say, permanent access to data, data products and services that scientists and researchers can use to support this transformation from uh, science into policy. Uh, what's the current landscape at the moment? So in the, let's say, the last three decades, so considerable progress has been made in developing ocean standards, ocean services, but also in establishing ocean data management infrastructures. And uh, on this slide, you can see some of the European data management infrastructures. Um, like, for example, we have already mentioned several times today the CMMS services, uh, Imodnet, uh, but also Eurobis for marine biodiversity and so on. So all these data infrastructures uh, over the past years uh, were able to really reach high quality standards in providing thematic services and data. Uh, but still, so what's the gap that still needs to be filled then in this landscape? Uh, so we could say that the gap is the same that brought the European Commission to launch three years ago the European Open Science Cloud Initiative. Uh, the way we do science has changed. So today scientists are I mean, confronted with a huge volume of data that they have to manage. But also, as we heard several times today during the webinar, uh, to address grand societal challenges like the climate change, the ocean sustainability, but also what we are facing now with this uh, COVID situation. So uh, we need more and more cross-disciplinary research to address these challenges. So these two things, the need um, for the scientists to have available tools to manage a huge amount of data, but also the capability to access multidisciplinary data. So these are the drivers, uh, these are the gaps that need to be filled, and these are the drivers that actually uh, are behind a recent, the recently uh, Horizon 2020 project, Blue Cloud, um, funded by the European Commission. Uh, what we are trying to do or what we are working on in Blue Cloud is uh, in fact to try to federate the infrastructure that you see on these slides and to establish a federation and in, an interoperability at the level of data, resources and tool to better equip scientists with tools to make uh, more efficient science. So going back to uh, the challenges, uh, so clearly, I mean, and this is what we have already seen in, uh, in the initial months of our project, that there are lots of challenges to get there to that vision of a federated ocean ecosystem. So the first challenge, uh, it's still related to the awareness creation. 
So we have plenty, let's say, of uh, data management infrastructures uh, in the marine area. But what we noticed also when we started with our project, uh, which is composed by different partners representing the, these different infrastructures, was that uh, uh, some of those who were not aware of the services or the data made available by others. So increasing the awareness uh, is really something that still needs to be addressed. Uh, the second challenge uh, is uh, related to the fair culture. So uh, we have already talked about this also previously in the webinar, uh, but clearly, so there is a need uh, to create this fair uh, culture. And uh, there was a report uh, recently released by PricewaterhouseCoopers that has estimated that the lack of available fair data uh, is costing around 10 billion euros to European user organization. So that's a huge amount um, of money that can be used in a better way. And we are not still there. It's not just an issue of fair data, but actually we should look at improving still the quality, the, the documentation and the provenance of information. Uh, in particular, I want to focus on these two last points, documentation and provenance, because these are two aspects that are fundamental for making science reproducible. And that's what we need in situation like this one that we are facing with the COVID. So scientists need to be able to build on previous work done by others. Um, we also approach uh, the topic about the modeling, okay? So we this increase the data availability so we can work towards implementing ensemble model approaches to improve the predictive capacity. So these practices is more uh, evolved, let's say, in the climate change area, but not that much in the others. Um, coming back to enabling interoperability, so we are talking about uh, uh, different things here. So we want to make marine infrastructures interoperable to better leverage the resources that they made available. And the challenge is not just really at the technical level, of course, still there are technical challenges, but sometimes in many cases, it's more at governance, at the governance and the business model level. So therefore, um, the step beyond this, it's also to federate also with other infrastructure providing computing and storage. And clearly, it's not just about disciplines, but it's also about the geographical governance, uh, coverage. So we want to strengthen the global data availability. Say that, so these big challenges can bring big opportunities. We have already talked about the culture for sharing data. We can increase the use of marine data management infrastructures, expand their capabilities with resources coming, for example, for the European Open Science Cloud, to work towards what we call this global blue cloud. So an interoperable framework to fully federate global ocean data. And we have already spoken about the digital ocean twin, so I'm not going to comment this uh, again. And that's close my five minutes introduction. I put on the screen the questions and I hand it over to you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm actually going to start with a question that Britt Alexander has. And because we are, uh, we are dealing with the background stuff, she can't put it in the question and answer. So she gets to have first chance. Um, so she's asking about your global blue cloud and what are your plans to connect multidisciplinary multi multidisciplinary data um, on an international level. How do you plan to do that? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. So the, as I said before, so in the context of Blue Cloud, clearly we are starting from a European level. So we have uh, uh, European infrastructures, uh, but also already within these European infrastructures, uh, they are already connected to data originators and data providers outside Europe. Um, in addition to that, so we are working on a roadmap, a policy roadmap uh, that we have just started drafting. And this policy roadmap, we are trying to engage other uh, initiatives outside Europe. And we announced first this uh, roadmap at the recent All Atlantic Ocean Research Forum. And we will continue in the next month to engage uh, external stakeholders uh, from non-European countries because we really want their contribution and their 
um, feedback on what we are doing uh, in terms of vision for a global blue cloud. Excellent, thank you very much. And then there's just been a question from Fabian Jacques um, about uh, the ensemble modeling approach and what uh, does the, will the blue cloud develop models? Do, do you plan to have that kind of facility there? So that's not one of our major uh, scope, let's say, but uh, in blue cloud, uh, we are validating the technology and the framework uh, that we are putting together via five use cases. And in these use cases, we have scientists that clearly are working with the models. So in a certain way, we are trying to um, include them in, uh, in our work. So that for sure, that will be a good testing also for, for us uh, to see if there yeah. is really another value. Yeah. Um, and then I think there was a, a good question by Anne-Catherine. Um, there is a requirement in, in most national and EU funded projects, there's now a requirement to develop data management plans for any kind of publicly funded um, projects. Um, and that has obviously created quite a lot of data flow and data sharing, which is great. Um, and the question is, can we facilitate that at an international level? Can we develop standards, guidelines um, for these data management plans and make sure that the data actually flows? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a, that's a good comment and I totally agree on that. And I think there are already some initiatives uh, doing that. So, for example, uh, I can mention the Research Data Alliance talking about research, research alliances. And uh, the Research Data Alliance, uh, so is an international effort, and uh, there are more than 10K members at the moment, and there are specific working groups and interest groups working on this topic. The real purpose of the Research Data Alliance is really to discuss standards and uh, best practices uh, related to data sharing, but also to data management plans. And uh, with the new establishment, or what's going on with the establishment of BIOSC, which is also happening in other countries, uh, because we have similar data commons initiatives in Australia, and something is also emerging in the US. So these will become key topics and questions to answer. Yeah. Uh, and then one final question from Gilles Ricola, who is the chair of the European Marine Board, so I can't ignore him. Um, he, he asks, um, will the European data management research infrastructures like ECOS contribute to the IOC's IODE program? So the, uh, I don't know, there's too many acronyms there. You know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I hope so. Uh, so yes, definitely. I mean, uh, ICOS, for example, was one of the infrastructure that I had on my previous slide. So these, uh, all the marine infrastructures operating in Europe are now at least engaged in this sort of umbrella uh, uh, initiative, which is Blue Cloud. So really, the idea is to link all of them and bring all of them together to to create first this interconnection, not just at technical level, but also more, as I said, at governance level. We need to understand how all these actors can work together. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, next steps is that we will be building on the outcome of today's webinar um, and of your evaluations. We will obviously be mobilizing experts um, in the proposed topics. We will be dis discussing solutions um, to strengthening the international ocean governance and the preconditions for successful implementation. This will happen in some dedicated online workshops that will be happening uh, from May to July. And then um, we will also have an online stakeholder consul consultation that will be launched by the EU. It will be a, a combination of the discussion paper and the outputs from the topic de dedicated webinars. Um, and it'll uh, present a range of solutions that can strengthen the IOG um, and their preconditions for success. And it will be happening over the summer. So please look out for that. Um, then we will have a conference, <clears throat> as the commissioner said, um, hopefully COVID dependent um, in Brussels, hopefully in December, um, possibly from the 9th to the 11th. This is all up in the, in, in the air at the moment. It will be a, a, a physical meeting, hopefully. That we will, where we will share and consolidate results uh, for the first cons uh, consultation steps. Um, and then there will be again another seminar, uh, another 
a conference in Brussels in spring 2021, also in person, hopefully, um, where we will be presenting the EU's roadmap to support the IOG, the International Ocean Covenant. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you, but we will have some concluding remarks now. Maybe Stephanie can, uh, can give us her final uh, thank you. Um, so Stephanie is the International Relations Officer for DG Mare, for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. And she, is the, she has the responsibility for developing um, uh, the, the International Ocean, uh, Ocean Governance Agenda um, for, and, and is responsible for the EU 2030 Agenda uh, um, and the Our Ocean uh, Conferences. So Stephanie, you go ahead. So thank you very much. And uh, let me start with thanking all the speakers and also the participants today. Um, this has been a very interesting session with a lot of useful food for thought for further discussions that we will have, as Sheila just presented to you, and how we can continue strengthening the knowledge base on, knowledge base on oceans further as part of the EU's international ocean governance agenda. I'm sure Sigi will have a lot of very uh, comprehensive and to the point remarks uh, and reactions to what was said in particular on research, so I won't uh, react to that in detail at all. However, two points I would like to make, and um, the first one concerns the science society policy interface that we discussed quite a bit. Uh, ocean governance, of course, depends on a sound understanding of our oceans, how they react to cumulative impacts of human activity, and also of how we can ensure the sustainable use of their services and resources, which is the main priority for our agenda. Um, integrated ocean research, science and operational oceanography as well, as mentioned today, helps us to capture the ocean as a complex and highly dynamic and interactive system as it is. And also to assess the policy measures that we do to see if they deliver their underlying objectives. Um, as scientific models and mod uh, methods evolve uh, and more and more elements of the socio-ecological sy system is involved, um, they increasingly help us to address the knowledge gaps that we have, but also generate new sources of uncertainty. And having said that, I think what I find important here to raise is that knowledge will never be perfect, as we all know. Um, but that at the same time, policy needs to take action in line with a precautionary principle and therefore needs to find ways to incorporate these uncertainties. And therefore, how we take these uncertainties into consideration for policy action should be part of a science society policy interface. And um, just as a side remark and picking up also on something that Jörn said there is, um, to me, this interface is a, is a two direction and very dynamic, ever evolving relationship that bases a lot on communication. And I think this is why, I, for example, really like to actually call it a dialogue, um, where it's very important that we talk and listen to each other. Um, we see the Ocean Governance Forum, uh, that we also have today here um, itself as a contribution to strengthen this dialogue between and also among the different actors and looking at what was discussed and um, to see all the good thoughts that were shared. I think we managed that uh, today also very well. Um, a second comment I would like to make is uh, with, the, uh, with regards to the discussion we had on ocean observations. Two major programs in the EU have been mentioned already. One is the Copernicus program operating ocean services at the global and EU scales with a lot of cooperative agreements with many countries, which also, by the way, is a very important uh, part of the alliances and cooperation coordination that we need vis-a-vis -vis the knowledge base on oceans. Um, and then we do have AMODNET, which acts as the EU marine data knowledge base. And here, I, what I would like to mention is that in light of the UN decade for ocean science for sustainable development, we actually will implement a more integrated, accessible and interoperable approach for AMATNET to facilitate the use of a EU marine data and observation for research policy and business, as well as support the dialogue between the different sectors. Furthermore, um, linking to what uh, George said uh, on, on further action needed for ocean observation, I would also like to highlight um, that we will actually launch an initiative on ocean observation to harmonize national efforts. At the moment, 
this is planned uh, for the fourth quarter of this year. Um, but of course, we will have to confirm this timing in light of the current situation. Um, I could say more things, but uh, we were so good in timekeeping, so I will stop here to also give time for Sigi, which hopefully now has um, managed to reconnect. Um, let me just finish one more time to say thank you very much for the great uh, presentations and all the good uh, question and answers, which will keep us busy for the weeks to come to look at and make sure that everything that was brought up will be caught in the further discussions. And also I would like to express my thanks in particular to our assistance mechanism uh, led by Fresh Thoughts to support the organization of the International Ocean Governance Forum and for today's webinar session, of course, here in particular, the European Marine Board, uh, Brit and Sheila, which have been very crucial to make this happen today. So thank you very much and I leave it with that. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, I'm not sure if we have Ziggy yet. Now, the discussions, as uh, I am sure every one of you agrees, have been very rich and they show the role of science, but also the need for further science research and technological development that we can advance in the international ocean governance and realize the European EU Green Deal. A couple of key words which were mentioned by several speakers. First of all, Sheila, you reminded us about the importance of taking account of the whole value chain all forms of knowledge production. Indeed, ocean governance needs science, data, and models. We heard about the shift of importance. Ocean science needs to be more responsible, more actionable. However, while still preserving the aim of blue sky science. And it needs to put people and society at the center. The societal relevance, the solution driven processes and approaches, the tool and the means co-designed, federating cooperation, taking account of local indigenous knowledge, place-based, that was mentioned on several occasions. Knowledge exchange on equal footing, effective science, society, and policy interfaces. The need for transdisciplinary, stronger integration of science research and infrastructures, open access, but also how to engage with industry and academia for transfer of data and research results. Only sound science can ensure that right and informed decisions are taken, but timing is a crucial factor. So when does sound science actually be made available? The policymakers need as well to be educated. We have heard about overlaps when it comes to alliances, when it comes to infrastructures, when it comes to the pur purposes. But how again to ensure value chain type of thinking and optimize the relevance of research alliances. We also listened to some interesting examples, the Ocean 5D but, and also the Blue Cloud. Integration came up on many, many times. Integration and the systems approach, the land, climate, biodiversity. So all this requires a holistic systems approach in the science thinking and in the whole value change thinking. The, the responding to cooperative mode and fully taking advantage of diversity. And it was good here that the gender issue and also the young people and the young talents came up. Fair culture was mentioned, and it's not only an issue of data, it's a quality and provenience of knowledge, making science reproducible, which of course is extremely important now in the post uh, in the post-virus crisis. Infrastructures should not only integrate, but also federate. And we spoke a lot, a, a lot about the geographical balance and the cooperation. Cooperation is on equal footing. We need to listen and not to export our model of cooperation, to take account of the different forms of knowledge, as I said before. So I conclude, I would like to stress one point. Many issues discussed, questions raised and opportunities illustrated that the discussion today has also relevance for the discussions that were held yesterday and the day before. So we've, on our side, we'll have to make sure that this will actually feed into the final recommendations, which will bring us to the next phases. We need to bring in much more as well industry and society. I took this as, as, a, as a personal as well plead for our work. And uh, we have 
to continue to work all together in an equal and fair way. And I think with that, I close. Again, thank you as well, Sheila, for making sure that I could navigate finally in the cyberspace as well. And I wish all of you a good continuation. Keep well and safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Ziggy. If not before, on a webinar somewhere else. Okay, bye.